All right, folks. So uh, again, just for this movie recording, um, this is Monday, um, September 30th, 2019. And we are working on the second PowerPoint in our metabolism unit. So this is PowerPoint B. And we're going to be talking about specific metabolic pathways. And we had just barely started this um, unit last Wednesday. So you guys, so we are talking about our, our focus here is going to be how cells make ATP. And we are starting out describing conditions on early birth. And we, got, and we know, folks, that when those first little cells evolved on primitive earth, what was Earth's <coughs> atmosphere like? It was anaerobic, right? And furthermore, you guys, cytochromes haven't been evolved yet, and cytochromes are crucial parts of electron transport chains. So there was no molecular oxygen, there were no electron transport chains, thus those early cells couldn't carry out the process we're most familiar with called aerobic respiration, right? So we want to look at a primitive way that those first early cells made a little, little bit of uh, glucose from, sorry, they made a little bit of ATP from glucose, right? And this uh, primitive way of making ATP is called glycolysis. This is going to be the emden meyerhof um, uh, glycolytic pathway. And what's so cool, you guys, is our cells still remember how to carry out this process, okay? So now, really important, you guys, when I show you the, the glycolysis, do not panic, right? And obviously, you can't even read it. Um, but you do not need to know intermediates. You don't need to memorize the names of the enzymes. Really, what we want to know is what's going in what's coming out, and what does the cell accomplish, okay? So that's going to be our main goal here. And I'll try to put the, the key points, you guys, up on the board, and maybe I can even, like, move my laptop here so we can do, like, little, maybe we can catch the, the, um, the board here as well. Okay, so you guys, so this is glycolysis, right? And we can describe it as the partial oxidation of glucose, meaning we're not going to rip off all the high-energy electrons, okay? So we're going to do partial oxidation of glucose. Okay, it's an anaerobic process. What does that mean, you guys? It's anaerobic. There's no oxygen is required, right? And what some important products we're, uh, we're going to make, we're going um, to we're going to have a gain of 2 ATP per glucose. And folks, this is by a process called substrate level phosphorylation, and not to get too hung up on uh, the phrase yet, because when we finally get to aerobic respiration, we'll have something to compare it to. But we're going to get a gain of 2 ATP per glucose by substrate level phosphorylation. And another, um, another important product, you guys, is we're going to produce two of our reduced NADH, right, our reduced NADH. And then the final thing we want to remember, you guys, is what happens to our carbon skeleton. So we're going to start out with a six-carbon a six glucose, and during glycolysis, sugar splitting, we're going to end up with two three-carbon products, okay? And those... Um, And those two three-carbon products, you guys, you can call them either pyruvate or pyruvic acid. You can use either term. It was like a short answer. Okay, so those are the main events. And then, you guys, on the board, what we want to do, really superficial, we want to just cartoon, you know, um, just the basic, basic steps. So, you guys, what I'm going to do, this is my glucose. And remember, it has six carbons. It's a hexose. And you guys, it's carrying our high energy electrons, right? We're, we're using the model that the electrons are packets of energy. And as we're moving the electrons, we're going to release some energy. And some of that energy will be, re will be used, will be captured to make ATP. Now, folks, in um, glycolysis, if there's 10 enzyme catalyzed steps, how many different enzymes do we need? 10, 10, 10 different enzymes for each of the enzyme catalyzed step. And you guys, again, you don't have to memorize this, but the steps are here in the PowerPoint. You know, each of these are a step. I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to be memorizing intermediates or um, enzyme names. So you guys, I'm just going to put a series of arrows 
to represent the 10 enzyme catalyzed steps. Okay. So first of all, you guys, let's just follow what's going to happen to our, our glucose skeleton here. So we start with the six carbon glucose. We're going to end up with two what? What happens to the glucose skeleton? It gets split in two, right? And what are we going to end up with at the end? Okay, yeah, no, that's that's good. You guys are spot on. So if we're just looking at the, uh, the carbon skeleton right now, right, we're going to end up with two pyruvate, and each of those is um, made up of three carbons. So we're always kind of counting our carbons to make sure we don't lose carbon somewhere, right? And then, folks, for this process to occur, let's, let's see what else has to go in. And again, you guys, very superficial. We'll look at cool things that are coming out. So what's kind of ironic with this, if this whole process is to make ATP, it's odd because to get the whole thing started, we have to spend ATP, right? So we have to use two ATP. And a reason for this, you guys, is uh, we need to start destabilizing the glucose. It's, it's in a pretty stable you know, um, uh, configuration all those strong covalent bonds. So what the cell is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate the glucose. So it's going to, it's going to use two phosphate groups to help um, phosphorylate the glucose to make this intermediate. And again, you guys, you don't need to worry about it. This is our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and the two yellow circles represent the phosphate groups. And the six little gray balls are the carbons. And, and again, Dr. Naganuma explained this to me. He says, if you think of phosphate groups at the, um, the pH of the cell, the phosphates have negative charges, right? And, and we'll just imagine it is a linear molecule. Okay, so let's say this is the glucose, and you have this negatively charged phosphate here, negatively charged phosphate there. What do we know about like charges? They, they repel, right? And so we could argue that starts to help destabilize this, this um the glucose, right? Because we have almost like the stress, the strain on the carbon skeleton from these phosphates repelling one another, right? And then, of course, with the help of an enzyme, you guys, then we're going to have um, hydrolysis of a covalent bond, and we'll end up with these two three-carbon phosphorylated intermediates. And again, you guys, don't worry, don't worry about the intermediates, right? But that's where the glycolysis occurs. Now, in this process, right? Um, it's like, well, initially here, we've invested ATP, right? We've invested ATP, and we haven't started to rip off any electrons yet, right? But remember, we said this is a partial oxidation of glucose. We're going to rip off some high-energy electrons. So we need to have our electron carriers, you guys, our hydrogen atom carriers. So in glycolysis, it's, it's going to be NAD, right? So NAD is going to go in, and it's, it's going to accept a total of four high energy electrons, right? And we're going to end up with reduced NADH coming out is one of our, our um, uh, end products. And then you're like, well, where's the ATP? Well, finally, guys, the ATP production is going to occur down here towards the end. So we can see uh, there's one ATP, two ATP, three ATP, four ATP are going to be made. So um, to make this balance, you guys, I have the components of two ATP going in. I'm going to get four coming out, so I have to add some more building blocks of ATP. So I'm going to add two ADP, two additional phosphates. And as a result, you guys, this is the big payoff. We're going to make four ATP. But folks, what we want to know is what did the cell gain, right? So if the cell had to spend two ATP, Right? What was the gain of ATP for the cell? So it made four, right? But it had to spend two. So what was the gain? Two. Good. So the gain of ATP per glucose, you guys, is two ATP per glucose. Right? So that's what that's what the cell was after, right? Was that ATP. Alright, so you guys all right with that? Yeah. What is two ATP? So so right, so this is so crude, you guys, but like this is what's going in. This is what's coming out. And remember we said that the cell is going to make a total of four ATP for glucose. But what we want to know is what's the gain? You know, what is the cell profit, right? And so to find out what the cell profited, we have to say, well, how many ATP were spent? And this, the, here we have the cell spending, sacrificing ATP to get this whole thing started. 
So what we said was, since the cell made four ATP, but it spent two, okay, the actual gain was two ATP per glucose. Does that make sense? It's really weird, because it's like, wait, you're spending ATP, and yet you want to make ATP? You know, what's going on here? Over here? Okay. So, yeah. So if I have four ATP over here, yeah, that's inorganic phosphate. That's our symbol for an inorganic phosphate. So that's that third phosphate that we're going to link to the ADP to make ATP. And we've got two ADP, two phosphate there. Okay. Is that? I know. It's so confusing, isn't it, you guys? Okay. So, folks, so that's, in a nutshell, that is glycolysis for us. This is the level we need to know it for our lecture exam. And certainly, you guys, I'm not sure in A&P you, to, to, you might need to know intermediates. So you might need to know the enzymes. But for micro, you don't. Just this little cartoon kind of sums it up, okay? And again, you guys, this is just the text of it. So again, key events, you guys, in glycolysis, the six carbon glucose is split into two, three carbon, what is the end product called? Pyruvic acid or pyruvate, good. We have partial oxidation of glucose, so we're going to transfer some of the high energy electrons from glucose to what? Who's going to accept those high energy electrons? NAD, good, you guys. And then we're going to, we'll end up forming our reduced NADH. Um, and again, you guys, you want to remember that there's a total of four ATP made through substrate level phosphorylation. And since the cell had to use 2 ATP to get the whole thing started, the gain was 2 ATP for glucose. Awesome, you guys. And that's glycolysis in a nutshell. Okay. And you guys, this is just a cartoon of what we, we call um, substrate level phosphorylation. We're going to have challenges here. Oh my God, it shut off. Wouldn't you know it? Okay. This might be just an audio recording and not a movie recording. <laughs> So you guys, with substrate level phosphorylation, what we have is, in this case, if we're talking about substrate level phosphorylation to make ATP, we have some phosphorylated molecule. Phosphorylated means it has a phosphate group. And in substrate level phosphorylation, we're going to transfer that phosphate group from this phosphorylated molecule, in this case, to ADP, and that will make ATP. And again, folks, don't get too hung up on this right now. Um, the reason I just wanted to mention it is we're going to see an aerobic respiration. Most of the ATP is made by a totally different process. Okay, so just put this off, literally put it on the back burner. Okay. Now, you guys, there's big problems, though, with glycolysis. And the huge problem those little cells faced was that they have a limited amount of NAD, right? This is limited meaning there's not much of it. And the problem is, you guys, if a little cell is carrying out glycolysis, what's going to happen to all of its oxidized NAD? It's all going to get reduced, right? So what happens, you guys, when the cell runs out of NAD? What's going to happen? <coughs> a roadblock, right? You know, if, if there's no NAD, then the rest of glycolysis shuts down. This is like a roadblock. And you guys, where is the cell making ADP? Before the roadblock or after the roadblock? After the roadblock. So what's going to happen to the little cell? It's, it's going to die, right? Because now it can't make any more ATP. So obviously, you guys, there had, to, there had to be a solution to this, right? And the solution, you guys, is so lovely. It's so elegant. The solution is what we'll call fermentation. So let me get rid of this. Okay. Okay. So the problem is, cell has limited NAD, right? So if it runs out of NAD, glycolysis and ATP production will stop, right? So the solution is this cool process you, call, you guys call fermentation. And let me show you what one of the early fermentation pathways, probably one of the earliest fermentation pathways, and then we'll talk about what's the definition of fermentation. Okay, so you guys, again, I'm a bad scientist, but I'm like, I'm pretending I'm the little cell. I've got this dilemma, right? I'm running out of NAD. So 
what is the solution? Well, if I could take my reduced NADH and get rid of the electrons, I could regenerate my NAD, right, to keep glycolysis working. So that means, hmm, I need a dumping ground. I need some place I can dump my electrons, right? And so if I'm a little cell, I'm like, well, gee whiz, says the little cell. This is just waste product to me, this pyruvate. I'm not going to do anything with it. So how about I dump my electrons from NADH onto pyruvate? It's a waste product anyway. Okay. So you guys, this is probably one of the earliest fermentation pathways where the little cell dumps the electrons from NADH onto pyruvate. Okay. This is what the little cell is after right here. This step is oxidizing. The NAD, now why is this helpful, you guys? Why does a little cell need the oxidized NAD? Why does a little cell need the oxidized NAD? So to, exactly, to keep glycolysis operating, right? So this then can feed back, right? So the NAD keeps glycolysis working. Does that make sense? Or functioning, right? And again, you guys, this pyruvate, it was already waste product. The little cell wasn't going to do anything to it. So we just want to ask, what happens when we reduce pyruvate? We get to lactic acid. Okay. So this fermentation pathway, you guys, um, often fermentation pathways are named after their end products. So what do you think this fermentation pathway is called? Lactic acid fermentation. Exactly. Okay, so for example, lactic acid fermentation. And you guys, the, if you read the books, it's like different authors describe fermentation differently. Some authors say fermentation is just what happens um, starting with pyruvate. So some people would say, well, this is lactic acid fermentation. But as a teacher, I always say, well, if the cell takes glucose and carries out lactic acid fermentation, then, then I'm starting with glucose up here, and so I'm including glycolysis and this final step right here. So on the lecture exam, I'll try to make it really clear. If I'm asking you a fermentation question, are we starting with glucose and including glycolysis, or is it just like the final step, what's going to happen to pyruvate? Does that make sense, you guys? So if I said, you guys, uh, lactic acid fermentation starting with glucose, then we could say, you know, step, 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 step. So what are the important end products? We're going to end up with two lactic acid. And what did the cell gain? It gained two ATP for glucose. And we also want to remember it regenerates what? The NAD, right? To keep glycolysis operating. Yeah? And you guys, this is just a fancier... Um, picture. This is that, that last step where, where the cell uses the pyruvic acid, and then here's the reduced NADH. It's going to dump its electrons onto the pyruvate and make the lactic acid. Yeah. Now, you guys, this lactic acid fermentation is so cool. So, um, so if we're talking lactic acid fermentation, your cells still remember how to do this. Your human cells. Remember, lactic acid fermentation. So, for example, you guys, if, let's say, um, like the classic one is, let's say you're maybe running, you know, running really fast or running a long distance, and your muscles become anaerobic, right? You aren't, can't get enough oxygen to them. What can, they, what can your muscles do for a short little time to make just a tiny bit of ATP? They'll switch, to, they'll switch to lactic acid fermentation, right, under anaerobic conditions. And that will give you just maybe, a, you know, enough ATP so you can escape. Like they say, maybe you're running from a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. And, and also, guys, I think this is really important because in, um, so you go, um, muscles and um, anaerobic. And also, guys, when your patients become septic, 
Remember how we talked about there's a decreased blood flow to the tissues? What, what, is, what, is, what did the, the human cells switch to? Lactic acid fermentation. And so in some, your colleagues that work in ERs, they say they monitor a patient for acid, um, acid, um, um, the presence of acids in, in the bloods as a, as a signal that maybe this, the patient isn't getting good blood flow, right? Because now the cells are going to uh, fermentation rather than aerobic respiration. And then, folks, in addition, there's many bacteria, and we call them the lactic acid bacteria. It's like a family, the lactic acid bacteria. And this is a big family. It includes the genus Streptococcus, uh, Lactobacillus, And these are often used to ferment dairy products. Dairy means milk products. And dairy again just means milk. And also, you guys, these are used, they're used to also ferment vegetables. Now, what's really cool, you guys, is that if, if we had, for example, fresh milk, and you tasted fresh milk, and then you tasted fermented milk, and this could be yogurt, buttermilk, kefir, um, the, um, you would detect the increase in acid by what, what taste, what flavor? Sour, sour right? Right? So when you say, like, buttermilk, it's so much sour than fresh milk, you're detecting that high acid production, right? And also, you guys, when we take, say, cabbage, and we make kimchi out of it or sauerkraut, right, we do a, a lactic acid fermentation, you taste fresh cabbage, and then you taste your fermented cabbage. How does the fermented cabbage taste? Sour? Does it taste sour, right? Yeah? And again, you're detecting that um, lactic acid production. Now, you might say, well, who cares about this? Well, what's so cool, you guys, is with um, fermentation, like in this case, the fermentation uh, produces acids, right? Right? So we know we're going to have an increase in hydrogen ion. What's going to happen to the pH? It's going to, is the pH going to go up or down? Yeah. It, right, it's that weird inverse relationship, right? So we got a decrease in pH, right? And you guys, this is awesome. Like the lactic acid bacteria, they can decrease the pH from like, say milk is about a pH of about seven. When those little lactic acid guys are finished, the pH drops to about around seven, right? So we're gonna have a pH of seven and then we have lactic acid fermentation. That's a a 1,000-fold increase in hydrogen ions, a 1,000-fold increase in hydrogen ions. And you're like, well, who cares? Well, you guys, that high acid will inhibit spoilage microbes, right? So the, we could say the high acid, low pH, high acid, low pH inhibits spoilage microbes. And usually we think of spoilage microbes, these are little darlings that are going to attack, for example, proteins. And, and there's actually fermentation processes on proteins, you guys, making really horrible things like cadaverin and putrescine, right? So when food spoils, there's probably a natural selection. We, we abhor the smell of spoilage, spoiled food, right? It's probably kind of a survival um, benefit for us. But again, you guys, in, in the old days, our ancestors didn't have refrigerators. Often they wouldn't have much salt to preserve. So they discovered kind of ser serendipitously that um, the fermentation of milk would preserve the milk in the absence of refrigeration. The fermentation of vegetables would preserve the foods in the absence of refrigeration. And you guys, the other thing that's really awesome that we're kind of rediscovering, those fermented foods are chock full of beneficial microbes, right? So those fermented foods that our ancestors have been making for forever are probiotics, 
right? And so to me, it's kind of funny because now that we've discovered probiotics, beneficial microbes we ingest, now if a company puts probiotic on its label, it charges you 10 times more, right? And it's like your grandparents, great-grandparents were doing this, you know, all the time. And you can do it at home too, right? So just anyway, just that little plug there. Okay, so okay, so what have we talked about? We've talked about lactic acid fermentation. We said this was an early way for the first primitive cells to make ATP. We've talked about how our own cells remember how to do lactic acid fermentation, right, under anaerobic conditions. We've talked about how um, microbes um, that carry out lactic acid fermentation, we can use them to preserve our foods in the absence of refrigeration. And another clinical application, you guys, is these lactic acid bacteria, let me, let me do a little, little um, asterisk down here, you guys. They're part of our normal <laughs> microbiome, and they colonize our mucous membranes. So they're uh, members of the good human microbiome. They colonize mucous membranes. from the, the mouth. They don't colonize the stomach, you guys, but they colonize um, in our mouth, um, intestines, the anal rectal area. And in women, you guys, this is really important, they colonize the vaginal mucosa. And it's awesome, you guys, they're part of our natural defenses. And the reason is they use the sugars our bodies produces, they ferment them and make lactic acids and then make the pH of those mucous membranes really pretty acidic. And that's gonna inhibit the growth of opportunistic pathogens like Candida albicans that we've looked at in lab and which you'll look at in the, um, the 1230 lab. And so you guys, what happens if we use broad spectrum antibiotics? Broad spectrum antibiotics killing a wide range of bacteria. What do they do to our protective lactic acid bacteria. Kills them, right? And as a result, who can then start growing? Can, can eat albicans, right? Because it's a yeast, it's a fungus, not killed by the antibiotics. So that's why you guys often you got to watch your patients following broad spectrum antibiotic. Make sure they don't end up with a secondary yeast infection, right? And again, you guys, it's showing us that our good normal microbiome, it is part of our defenses. It's part of our defense against potential pathogens. And again, this is another reason why we don't want to take antibiotics unless we absolutely have to. And, um, and ideally, you guys, if, if the healthcare provider knows the identity of the bacterial pathogen, you would like to use a narrow spectrum antibiotic, right? Because you don't want to kill all your good guys. Yeah, okay, all right, guys. Now, so, you guys, do you need to know lactic acid fermentation for lecture exam two? Yes, you do. You do have to know that. And one more, um, one more, you guys, I have no idea if this is recording or not. I have a blank screen, but just in case they can see the, the board. The other fermentation pathway, you guys, I'd like you to know is alcoholic fermentation. And this is going to be carried out by our bakers <laughs> or brewer's yeast. What's the scientific name, you guys, for bakers or brewer's yeast? Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right? And what Saccharomyces cerevisiae will do, they'll carry out glycolysis, and then it's going to take the pyruvic acid. Now, this is a little bit more complicated, okay? It's a two-step fermentation process. The first step is the Saccharomyces is going to rip off one of the terminal carbons and release it as what? Carbon dioxide, right? Is that a gas? Is that a gas? Yeah. So you guys, when you're making leavened bread, why does your bread dough rise? Yeah, it's the CO2, right, from your, um, your baker's yeast, your Saccharomyces releasing the CO2, right? And then you guys, it's this two-carbon intermediate called acid aldehyde that ends up being what we would call the terminal or final electron acceptor, right? So NADH will dump its electrons on the acid aldehyde regenerating oxidized NAD, and then what do we end up with? Ethanol, right, a two-carbon alcohol. So you guys, when you eat baked bread, why don't you get drunk? What happens to the ethanol during baking? It evaporates, right? Yeah? But you guys, if we took, like, grape juice, or if we took, um, 
fermented grain and we added our Saccharomyces and maybe fermented it in a closed container, right? And then after several weeks of fermentation, when we remove the cap, what might happen? Sparkles, yeah, sparkling, the so-called frizzy sparkles, the carbonation, right? And then since you didn't heat that product, you guys, what would be present in the liquid? The alcohol, right? So, so the product would be beer <coughs> using fermented grains, and the product would be what, you guys, if we use, say, grape juice? Wine, good, good job, right? And oh, and you guys, just one thing. Um, um, I found this really fascinating. Between high school and college, I spent a year in Germany um, going to a German high school. And in my family, my host family, I had a two year old little sister and a four year, four year old little brother. And this was really different to me, you guys, because um, what, what, what in the family, the kids, would be sometimes given like diluted, like diluted beer or diluted wine, and I thought, wow, that's 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 kind of interesting, right? But then I started thinking, you guys, as a microbiologist, um, historically in Europe, drinking water was contaminated with what feces, right? I mean, clean water is a huge one, you guys, and in Europe, you know, back in the day. Having clean drinking water that wasn't contaminated with feces, that was probably, I don't know, such a luxury. Most people didn't have access to clean water. And we know, you guys, feces carries lots and lots of pathogens, right? So when water's contaminated with feces and we drink it, we have fecal, fecal oral transmission of all of these pathogens, including a lot of pathogens that would cause diarrhea. And so I was thinking, you guys, I mean, I wonder if, like, back in the day, the thought was, well, maybe it was safer for, for the kids to drink beer or wine diluted rather than have them drink water, right? Because little kids, they get diarrhea. They can die from that, right? And furthermore, it's like, well, if they diluted it with water, wouldn't that have the fecal pathogens in it? But, and this is me, you guys, maybe I'm going to extremes. But what does ethanol do? What does ethanol do to proteins? It denatures them, right? So I'm wondering, you guys, if this was kind of a holdover for, from, from the day when it might have been safer if you're going to drink the water, you add some beer or wine to it, you know, because maybe that would inhibit the growth of some of those fecal pathogens. Maybe I'm making this up, right? Because I'm always trying to find some microbial public health connection to some of these, um, some of these um, kind of cultural practices. But I thought, you know, I bet you at one time in Europe, it was probably safer to drink beer or wine than it was to drink the water, right? Because the water would have all these fecal pathogens in it. It's not, not a very nice thought, is it? No, it's not a very nice thought. Okay. All right, you guys. So do remember lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation. So you guys, now here is our description then of fermentation, now that we've had a chance to talk about it a little bit. Um, so... Uh, Louis Pasteur was the one that first described fermentation, and he described it as life in the absence of air. And he, he you guys, historically, he helped save the French wine industry. The um, French winemakers, they were in a panic because their wine was turning sour. What does sour remind you of? Yeah, like a, maybe like a lactic acid fermentation. So what Pasteur discovered was that the French wine was getting contaminated with bacteria. They were taking the sugars and converting them into acids, and that's why the wine was tasting sour, right? So he was brilliant, guys. He was so down to earth. So he told the French winemakers, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your grape juice, and you're going to do what to it? You're going to heat it to kill the unwanted bacteria. What do we call that process, you guys, when we heat things to kill pasteurization, right? So he said, you're going to heat your grape juice to kill those bacteria, and then you're going to add what after you've heated your wine? You're going to add the Saccharomyces, right? So um, Pasteur has said he received this award for saving the French wine industry. He called the bacteria a disease of wine, and that 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 provided evidence for him pursuing the germ theory of disease, that microbes can invade another organism and cause disease. He, he, he said those bacteria were a disease of wine. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. Okay, so Pasteur came up with this. You guys, fermentation, is it a complete oxidation of glucose or only partial? 
It's only partial, right? We've only ripped off, per glucose, we've only ripped off each of these NAD, each of these reduced NADH, you guys carry two high energy electrons. So we've only ripped off four electrons so far, right? Partial oxidation of glucose. You guys, in fermentation, they talk about an internal terminal electron acceptor. What the heck are they talking about? So we want to know who is finally ending up with the electrons. And at one time were glucose. So you guys, in fermentation, we're using an internal, a molecule made within the cell, organic molecule is the terminal electron acceptor. So in lactic acid fermentation, it's pyruvate, right? Does it require oxygen? Nope, it's an anaerobic process. Does it require an electron transport chain? Nope, it doesn't. What's our, our gain of ATP per glucose? Two ATP per glucose, and the process by which ATP is made, and again, right now we're just memorizing this, substrate level phosphorylation, good. Now, you guys, this is the problem, though. Hmm. We just said that ethanol and alcohol will denature microbes, right? Right? Um, and acids, right? Low pH, what can happen to proteins? Denaturation, right? So you guys, would you argue that the products of fermentation, the acids and alcohols, are actually toxic? I would, I would argue that in high levels, those acids and alcohols are actually toxic, right? So if you had a lot of cells that were carrying out uh, fermentation, the acids, the alcohols could build up, and that could actually be harmful, right, to those microbes. So that's a disadvantage, right, of fermentation. And furthermore, you guys, the acids and alcohol end products, these guys are still carrying lots and lots and lots of high energy electron. This is wasteful. We're thro literally throwing away high energy electron. It's a wasteful process, right? If, if this is all you're going to do, you better have lots and lots and lots of preformed organic molecules, right? Because you're throwing away so many high energy electrons. So these are two disadvantages, you guys, of fermentation is that you're making toxic end products, alcohols and acids, and you're throwing away high energy electrons. It's very wasteful. Yeah. Okay, so those are the disadvantages. I wanted to throw this in here, you guys, because I didn't want you to think that um, there's only lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation. There's a whole variety of fermentation pathways, and you don't have to know these others, folks. Some of these we will be exploring in um, lab. Um, so we, we talked about lactic acid fermentation here. Um, um, we use this to make fermented vegetables, um, fermented dairy products, the Saccharomyces with the alcoholic fermentation. And then you guys, some of these others, pro Propioni bacterium, they're making acids, carbon dioxide, and molecular hydrogen. These guys, there's two places where I think of them. Uh, Propioni bacterium are associated with acne that can cause inflammation that contributes to acne. And the other place, you guys, you might not want to think of these at the same time, they're used in making Swiss cheese. They're responsible for making those big bubbles. That's from the carbon dioxide, molecular hydrogen. So, no, no, no. Okay, and then um, phosphorus, you guys, these guys are nasty, can be horrible tissue invaders, and we know they can make toxins. Um, the, often when we talk about um, gas gangrene, it's infection with clostridium, clostridium perfringens. They're using your tissues as a source of, of carbon and energy, carrying out fermentation, and these are some of the fermentation end products. And gas gangrene, you guys, the tissue is necrotic, it can kill you. Um, this is, these two, these two groups, you guys, um, will study in lab. Um, e. coli, salmonella, carryout, and pathway called mixed acid fermentation with all these different acids, really low pH. And then Enterobacter, close cousin of E. coli, carries out a different type of fermentation called butylene glycol fermentation. Why do we care? Well, we are going to run metabolic tests so we can determine is the microbe carrying out mixed acid fermentation? Is the microbe carrying out butylene glycol fermentation? And that's going to be part of our microbial um, diagnostic tests is to determine which fermentation pathway the microbe is carrying out. And that's going, to, that's going to be a clue as to the identity of the microbe. So we'll be coming back and visiting these fermentation pathways in lab. And again, you guys, because I'm visual and I like to eat, so I always think, you know, as a microbiologist, I, I have to support the fermentation sciences, so I'm eating lots of cheese. 
right? Yogurt, soy sauce is a fermentation product. Um, lime and fear fermentation products. Do not drink nail polish remover, you guys are running out of This is not good, right? And then vinegar. Actually, this is, this is, this, I just get carried away with this, you guys. Vinegar, usually you start out with some um, fermented product like wine or um, apple cider. Apple cider is fermented apple juice. And then the bacteria that actually convert it into vinegar, they're actually oxidizing bacteria, acetic acid bacteria. So this is maybe a little bit um, misleading, but that's okay. So we can say vinegar is a fermentation product too. I got kid. Anything dealing with food, you guys. So just, this is overkill, but it's just like fermentation is used by humans for so many different um, processes to make so many different things. So it's, it's um, pretty exciting. You know, you can just study fermentation and be, never get bored. Oh, how could I forget this, you guys? My two favorite fermentation products, coffee and chocolate. Did you know that both coffee and chocolate, they involve fermentation steps, right? So that's enough to make me want to study fermentation, coffee and chocolate, all oh, the two basic food groups in my life. Okay. And again, this is just to remind me that in lab, we will be doing um, metabolic tests, biochemical tests to detect specific fermentation pathways. And this gets fun in lab, you guys, because we often use pH indicators and they turn colors. And it's like, can life get better than things turning color in lab? Okay, so we'll be coming back to these in uh, lab. Okay, so you guys, we had already mentioned some problems with fermentation, right? So one, one is the end products, those acids and alcohols, are still chock full of high energy electrons. We're throwing them away. That's wasteful. And furthermore, you guys, those end products, those acids and alcohols, at high levels, they're toxic, right? Even to the little cells that are producing them. And, and so you guys, as a consequence, when life had been fermenting away for quite a while, and, and the, the um, our hypothesis is, you guys, is when the first early cells evolved, there were literally oceans of preformed organic molecules. So those first early cells could afford to be wasteful because there was a lot of preformed organic molecules present. But can you imagine, you guys, as their populations grew and all they're doing is fermenting and being wasteful, do you think eventually there was maybe like a food shortage? Right? Yeah, they started using up those preformed organic molecules. So that means there would have been natural selection for cells that could harvest more energy from the organic molecules, right? Harvest more, harvest more electrons, make more ATP for glucose, right? And furthermore, selection for new metabolic processes that wouldn't create such toxic end products, right? Wouldn't make the acids, wouldn't make the alcohols. So again, you guys, here, here we are back in natural selection and biological evolution, right? So you guys, there was um, this incredible evolutionary event that permitted the evolution of aerobic respiration. This is how our cells make most of their ATP, right, aerobic respiration. It's the process most of us are familiar with for ATP production. But it's like, how did the cells jump from fermentation to aerobic respiration? It, it's, it's a big jump. So you guys, I'm going to propose that... What made this, the evolution of aerobic respiration possible was the evolution of these organic molecules called porphyrin rings. Okay, so, so evolution of porphyrin rings. And let me see if I can fast forward to our slide, because I'm always writing on the board, and then I show you the slide, and I know that gets frustrating. Okay, I promise you guys we're coming back to this. Oh, my gosh. Okay, you guys, in last semester, I thought, oh, I'm going to introduce aerobic respiration, then tell you how it was made possible. Let me see. If I lost my porphyrin rings, I'm going to be so upset. Here we go. You guys, so I'm, I apologize. I'm going to jump from slide 16 to slide 20, because I want to actually kind of follow it in evolutionary history. So I do apologize to you guys. So we want to talk about these porphyrin rings. Okay, and let me show you first what a porphyrin ring looks like. 
So here's these gorgeous four horn rings, you guys. And you don't have to memorize the structure, but I just want you to know why they were so important, okay? So these porphyrin rings, they permitted evolution. Of, and it's a lot, you guys, it's a lot. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna split this into two branches. Okay. So the porphyrin rings permitted evolution of photosynthetic pigments. And the first one that evolved, you guys, was a primitive type of chlorophyll called bacteria chlorophyll. And at the very end of our um, metabolism lectures, you guys will come back and talk about bacteria chlorophyll. For right now, we're just going to stick it on the back burner. And then from bacteria chlorophyll, you guys, it was just a hop, skip, and a jump to the evolution of chlorophyll A. Now we know from lab, you guys, that chlorophyll A permits which amazing process? Yeah. Big, big, big event in the evolution of life. So chlorophyll A permits oxygenic photosynthesis, right? That amazing, amazing process in which the little, the little photoautotrophs can take inorganic carbon dioxide as a source of carbon. They can take low energy electrons from water in the presence of chlorophyll A and light. They can energize the electrons from water and through an incredible process transfer them to CO2 to make organic molecules such as glucose. And what's our other waste product, you guys? If we oxidize water, what are we going to end up with? Why is this called oxygenic? Molecular oxygen, right? Okay. Right? So the electrons that were energized by light energy are now carried by glucose, right? So now this is a source of chemical energy. Good. Okay, big deal, you guys, oxygen. So what happened to Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, it, it was converted from what to what? Anaerobic. Anaerobic to aerobic. That was a phenomenal event, you guys. That was just mind-blowing, right? Okay, but we said... Porphyrin rings permitted a whole nother branch of events. And you guys, what well, this this blows me away with these porphyrin rings. So porphyrin rings permitted evolution of cytochromes. And though, and folks, those of you that have had A and P or, or you know a good biology course, you know cytochromes are part of electron transport chains. And we're bad, you guys, we often say ETC for electron transport chains. And electron transport chains permitted the evolution of respiration. And again, you guys will see that amongst our little bacteria, the first type of respiration that evolved was called anaerobic respiration. And again, you guys, we'll talk about anaerobic respiration after we talk about the type of respiration we're most familiar with and what's that, you guys. Aerobic respiration, okay? And this is good, you guys. It gives me a chance to talk about, uh, it can get really confusing if you had A and P first, right? So, and I've, and, um, I've, the A and P professors and the micro professors have talked, and, and we've recognized, wow, no wonder some of our A and P folks are confused. Okay, so you guys, as microbiologists, as microbiologists, when we see respiration, this is telling us an electron transport chain is involved, right? Because little bacteria don't breathe. So we can't talk about like, like human respiration. We're talking about cellular respiration. And for us as microbiologists, when we see respiration, we know there's an electron transport chain involved. The first part of the, of the description tells us what is the final electron acceptor. So you guys, in aerobic respiration, what's the final? electron acceptor is oxygen, right? Right. So this is our definition of aerobic respiration. It's when ATP is going to be made using an electron transport chain and molecular oxygen is the final electron acceptor. We'll come back, you guys, and we'll see the more primitive type, the first type of respiration that evolved. It, these two were little cells that had electron transport chain, but there was no O2 that was involved, it's going to be some other molecule other than O2 is the, 
terminal electron acceptor. Okay, so you guys, um, so coming over here, the evolution of aerobic respiration, first the electron transport chains evolved, but then what was the other thing required for aerobic respiration to, to evolve? What did we have to have as our terminal electron acceptor? O2, O2 and check this out, right? Isn't that amazing, right? So the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis, we could say, was crucial in the evolution of aerobic respiration, right? Yeah, you guys, we're all linked. We're all linked. That's all I can tell you. Okay, so let me back up here. The, the first slide, you guys, is just kind of what we put up on the board, just differently. So the porphyrin rings permitted evolution of bacterial chlorophyll and oxygenic photosynthesis and permitted evolution of chlorophyll A, which permitted oxygenic photosynthesis, which converted Earth's atmosphere from anaerobic to aerobic. And then this is a guesstimate, you guys, that um, maybe around 2.6 billion years ago, like Earth's atmosphere was aerobic. It's interesting because I think it was after that point that maybe the eukaryotes evolved, right? Our modern atmosphere, you guys, is about 21% molecular oxygen. And then again, you guys, the perforant rings permitted evolution of cytochromes, which permitted evolution of electron transport chains, and thus permitted evolution of cellular respiration. We'll talk about the kind of odd anaerobic respiration that evolved first. And then you guys, the rest, the rest of today's lecture and probably part of Wednesday's lecture, we're going to be talking about um, the evolution of aerobic respiration. Okay, so that was kind of a big deal. Oh my goodness. Okay. So you guys, so we are headed for um, this description of, and I think for right now, you guys, I am going to skip slide 17, 18, and 19 because we're going to we're going to um, come back and describe these. So what I'm going to do, you guys, is I, I'm going to jump right into aerobic respiration, okay, and give us the big overview of aerobic respiration. And what I will do is I'm going to put the cart before the horse, you guys. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to um, after we give a, a description of aerobic respiration, I'm going to skip the first part and jump right to the function of the electron transport chains. Why, why did the evolution of electron transport chains and cellular respiration, why did, why did it permit like a 20-fold increase in ATP production for glucose? This was a big deal, you guys. This was a big event. Okay, so let's first just look at the, um, our uh, description of aerobic respiration. Okay, so this is aerobic respiration in a nutshell. And first, you guys, what I'll do is I'll put our, remember that redox reaction that I said for sure was going to be on um, lecture exam two? on the um, short answer section, I said, I'm going to ask you for the redox reaction showing <coughs> complete oxidation of glucose by aerobic respiration. So, okay, so what are we starting with? What's the source of our high energy electrons? Glucose. glucose. Awesome. And also as part of our reactants, you guys, I have to have that terminal, that final electron acceptor. And what is it in aerobic respiration? Oxygen. Awesome, you guys. So I'm just going to show a series of arrows to indicate like two hours of lecture, lots of enzyme catalyzed steps, right? And during this process, you guys, the cell slowly rips off high energy electrons from glucose. It can't rip them off all at once because if the cell ripped all, ripped all the high energy electrons off at once, so much heat would be released, what would happen to the little cell? It'd probably burn up, right? So it has to do it slowly, 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 patiently, patiently. And with the electron transports, we release energy, and we're going to see some an amazing amount of ATP will be made, right? But after we've ripped off all the high energy electrons from glucose, we're, we're going to oxidize it, right? What are we going to end up with? Yeah, just imagine, guys, just like you're going to rip off all the hydrogen atoms and their electrons. What are you going to end up with? CO2, right? Does that make sense to you guys? So that's oxidation. Right? <coughs> After those high energy electrons give up all their energy to help make some ATP, now they're low energy electrons. We can't throw them into the cytoplasm. Who do we donate them to? 
Oxygen, right? And so the oxygen is going to be reduced to what? Water. Good. Why does the cell do it? This is the part people forget on the short answer. Energy, right. Awesome, you guys. And about the highest efficiency is about one third will be used for ATP production. And these are crude numbers, you guys. They found out they're actually lower than this. I'm still going to use these old numbers 36 to 33 ATP per glucose. What happens to the other two thirds of the energy, you guys? It's lost as heat. Good. Okay, so that's that summary reaction, you guys. So now we'll look at. Um, the tax, okay. So, okay, so this is the complete oxidation of glucose. We're ripping off all the high energy electrons. Um, and this, you guys, we will cartoon this. This is the, the key evolutionary event. Um, the electrons ripped off of glucose eventually will be donated to this electron transfer chain. And the electrons are going to be going <coughs> from one member of the chain to the other, losing energy. And we're going to say, you guys, some of that energy will be used to pump protons across a member forming a proton gradient. And these proton gradients, you guys, are like little batteries. They're a source of potential energy. They're referred to as the proton motive force, right? So that little proton gradient, that little battery, it's going to be used as a source of ener energy to drive massive ATP synthesis by an enzyme called, I don't have it up here, ATP synthase. We will cartoon it. Um, those electrons, you guys, at the end of the ETC, they have to be do donated to somebody, the terminal, final electron acceptor, and who will that be? Oxygen, right? So it requires an aerobic environment. Oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. And again, you guys, these are the, um, the newer values. In the old days, we estimated 36 to 38 ATP. The new study suggests it's lower, like 34 ATP per glucose. And I just want to let you know, no, you guys, I apologize. I usually use the old ones. This is the hypothetical maximum. So on the exam, you guys, um, I'll try to make sure if it's multiple choice that, like, one choice would be how many ATP are made per glucose by aerobic respiration? Two. Is that right? No. Ten. No. If I put 34 or 36 or 38, say that's choice C, right? And if on choice D, I put 1,000. Right? So is it obvious what's the best choice, you guys? That choice C, right? So that's what I'll try to do, because again, it depends on the book you're reading. Sorry about that. All right. And you guys, that ATP is going to be made using a combination of substrate level phosphorylation, which we saw in glycolysis, and we're going to see it one other place. And then the cool event, you guys, is what's called um, the ATP. Most of it will be made by this amazing process called oxidative phosphorylation where that proton gradient is going to drive massive ATP synthesis. And this is an example, you guys, of a chemical gradient helping to do cellular work. This is called chemiosmosis. So you guys, this is like the whole two next lectures on one page. So if you're overwhelmed, just keep breathing. Okay? Uh, another advantage, you guys, in addition to like almost 20 times higher ATP production, the end products, look at the end products, you guys. They're not acids and Alcohols, it's carbon dioxide and water. So the end products are far less toxic and they're low energy, right? And, and, and furthermore, you guys, the intermediates in aerobic respiration, the cell can use many of those in anabolism, biosynthesis. We'll see some of the intermediates will be used to make amino acids and proteins. Some of the uh, intermediates will be used to make like nitrogenous bases and nucleotides. So it's pretty amazing, right? But obviously very complicated. Okay, so you guys, so let me just back up here and see what we're going to do here. Okay, so first of all, you guys, um, let me just share with you. We're going to use bacteria as our model organism. This is not in a eukaryote. It's not in a human. So we're going to be focusing on bacteria. And in bacteria, you guys, I'll just show you the steps here really quick. So this is a bacterium. We're going to be talking about multiple steps in aerobic respiration. So let me just walk through the steps, you guys. So glycolysis is going to be the first step. And then we're going to have what I call Krebs prep. I know that's not very helpful. Then we're going to have the Krebs cycle, also called citric acid cycle, also called the TCA cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle. 
So you guys, the enzymes for all of these are all in the where? They're all in the cytoplasm. So if I ask you where does glycolysis occur in a bacterium, what are you going to tell me? Cytoplasm. I ask you where does the Krebs prop occur in a bacterium? Cytoplasm. Where does the Krebs cycle occur in a bacterium? Cytoplasm. Don't you love bacteria? That's why I study bacteria, right? Okay. But then, you guys, the exciting event is going to be over here at the um, cytoplasmic membrane. Okay. Because this is where this is going to be my cartoon, you guys. For my electron transport chain. So let us cartoon kind of the main events here, like what makes aerobic respiration so different. So the electron transport chain, you guys, it has to be embedded in a membrane, and there's two reasons. Because the members of the electron transport chain, they have to be in a very specific sequence. They can't be all jumbled up here in the cytoplasm, right? Okay, so I'll just make my little electron transport chain here. And furthermore, you guys, the function, let's write this down because a lot of biology books mislead you. The function of the electron transport chain is to pump Protons. What's a proton, you guys? <coughs> Hydrogen atoms across a membrane. To form a proton gradient. That's the job of the electron transport chain, you guys. The job of the electron transport chain is to form a proton gradient across a membrane. Why? Because the proton gradient is a source of potential energy. It's like a battery. Potential energy is energy that can be used to do cellular work, like make ATP. Because a proton gradient is a source of potential energy that will used to make. What's our default answer, you guys? We don't know what to answer on metabolism, say ATP. Exactly, right? Remember, we need those default answers, right? And this process, you guys, it's called um, oxidative phosphorylation. And again, we'll come back and talk about this. And this use of a chemical gradient to do work is an example of what we call chemiosmosis. I'm throwing a lot at you at once, you guys. But again, this is kind of giving you the big, big map. And then we're going to go and look at the individual streets, OK? So you guys, just so you'll have this in the back of your mind, especially those of you in A&P, this can be really disorienting, right? Because you guys, in your cells, where are the enzymes for um, the Krebs prep? Same place as the enzymes for the Krebs cycle. Same place as where your e electron transport chains are. Yeah, your mitochondria. So you guys, this is really makes people who've had AMP and spent all that time learning aerobic respiration in human cells. They're like, what are you talking about, right? But just remember that, you guys. And our cells, the enzymes for Krebs prep, Krebs cycle, and the members of the electron transport chain are in our mitochondria, right? So you guys, this is going to be a lot easier than in humans, believe me. That's why I love bacteria. They're so much simpler. Okay? All right. Okay, you guys, so let me, let me cartoon really quick. This is like the big picture, and it's like of all the other um, details, if you forget all the other details, you guys, and you can just kind of remember where things are happening in the bacterium, and very importantly, you guys, what we need to know is how the bacterium is going to form that proton gradient and then what it will use a proton gradient for, okay? So, you guys, so again, we're, this is big picture, right? So, what the little bacterium is going to do is slowly <laughs> rip off electrons, slowly rip off electrons, right? Donate them to our little hydrogen atom electron taxi cabs, Lyft, Uber, delivery trucks, and what are those? 
NAD and FAD, think of those as Lyft or Uber for electrons or hydrogen atoms, right? And where are those electron hydrogen atom carriers, where are they heading? What's their destination? Mm, right? Okay. So you guys, I'm just going to show, trying to keep this simple because I'm so bad. I'm just going to show electrons. Okay, electrons are going to be delivered to the electron transfer chain, right? The electrons, you guys, will be passed from one member of the chain to the next, losing energy. Okay, and this is, this is kind of a simplified model, you guys. So as the electrons are transported down the electron transfer chain, they lose energy. And the cell can use some of that energy to do what? Pump protons. And this is active transfer, you guys, because we're moving the protons against their gradient. What does that mean? High concentration of protons out here, right? Compared to inside, this will be lower, right? A lower, we'll put lower, low. So you guys, we're transporting substance against the concentration gradient. So what kind of transport is that? Active transport, right? And what do we know about active transport? It requires energy. Now, you guys, this is the tricky part, right? Because we brainwash you and think that ATP is the only energy source, right? And you guys, this messes people with the lecture exam. You guys, what is the energy source? for the active transport that the ETC is carrying out. Electron, I heard it. You're the first class that got it. So you guys, the energy source is the electrons, right? And where did those high energy electrons come, come from? Way back when. From glucose, right? Right? Slowly the cells ripping them off, sending them to the electron transfer chain. They are the energy source for the electron transfer chain, right? Energy source, high energy electrons from glucose. Okay. Okay, so if you maybe you can think of it almost like as an electrical current running through the ETC, you guys, what's happening is the electrons are flowing through. What's being pumped? Protons, right? So now you guys, do we have a proton gradient across a membrane? Yeah, is that a source of potential energy? Yes, does it act as a battery? Yes, it does. Oh, somebody's got a gorgeous dog. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. So what, now we got a proton gradient, right? So you guys, we said this proton gradient, it, it can act as a source of potential energy. It's like a battery. It's sometimes referred to, you guys, as the proton motive force. Where can we put there? This is sometimes called the proton motive force. To remind us it can do some work. And here is, here's the coolest thing, you guys. So how the cell is going to make massive amounts of ATP is through this incredible enzyme complex called ATP synthase. Is that an ASE ending? Is that our enzyme ending? Okay. What is the function of ATP synthase? To make ATP. Awesome, you guys. And, and this is really crude, really simplified, you guys. But ATP synthase, it has an active binding site for ADP and inorganic phosphate. And what it's going to do, it's going to transfer the phosphate to ADP to make what? ATP, right? It's going to phosphorylate the ADP to make ATP, right? That's what the little cell's after. But you guys, that is biosynthesis. What do we know about biosynthesis anabolism? It requires energy. So you guys, this is very good. Great. So ATP synthase, its energy source is what? To make ATP, it has to have a source of energy. What is the source of energy? What's our battery? What's our battery? The proton gradient, right? And you're like, what? What's going on there? So you guys, this is what's going to happen. See how these protons have a positive charge? Can they diffuse across the phospholipid bilayer? Nope, right? 
they're going to require some water-filled channel. And guess what ATP synthase has? A water-filled channel. And guess who can pass through that water-filled channel? Protons. So you guys, what will happen is the one of the few ways the protons can flow back down their concentration gradient, right, from high to low, is going to be through ATP synthase. Now, you guys, this is, it's kind of like, I want to say it's like an electrical current, but instead of negative charges, these are what charges? Positive charges. And you guys, is this flow of positively charged protons going through ATP synthase, ATP synthase is, is a... Um, a protein, right? Do you think it's changing shape? Is it like, whoa, you know, little protons are blown, whoa, you know, right? That's silly. That's so ridiculous. They, they'll fire me if they hear me doing that. But you guys, so what's happening, and they have, they actually know the details of it, is as the protons are flowing through, the ATP synthase is actually rotating in space, if that's not the craziest thing. And it's helping to catalyze electron rearrangement so that we can get that phosphate attached to the ATP. Excuse me. The, we can get the phosphate attached to the AT, ADP to make ATP. So you guys, and I, again, I don't know all the bi biophysics of it, but if I ask you folks, what is the energy source that ATP synthase uses to make ATP, what are you going to tell me? It's a proton gradient, right? And specifically, you guys, it's the <coughs> flow of the protons through ATP synthase synthase that drives this massive ATP production. And you guys, wow, that's crazy. Can you imagine that evolving? I mean, it's just <coughs> it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Now, are you totally confused? Okay, good. All right. So now we can, now we'll dive into it. Okay, you guys, and, and I don't mean to be silly. I do not mean to be silly. So you guys, and I know that was painful, but sometimes I think, like the way I was taught aerobic respiration, we started at the beginning and we went through all the steps, and I was so lost by the time we hit the Krebs cycle. I was like, I have no idea what we're doing. And that's why you guys, even though I know this too was confusing, I wanted you to see the big picture, sort of the big picture, so that we go back and talk about the little, the each, you know, branch and leaf in, in our forest. You, you could come back and look at the big picture, yeah? So you guys... What the cell wants is high energy electrons to make a proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis. That's the big picture. Okay, so now let's see how it's going to do it. I know we're going to have five questions. Okay, so you guys, what, what is this? Let's see what this slide is. Okay, you guys, and this is just comparing how complex cellular aerobic respiration is compared to what? Fermentation, and you guys, it's worth it though because in fermentation, our gain was two ATP per glucose, right? And I'm, I'm stretching this, you guys, but you could argue in aerobic respiration, the cell <coughs> almost can hit, and this is a stretch, but can almost hit 40 ATP per glucose, so we're increasing ATP yield by 20 fold, and that's an amazing survival advantage when you're out there competing with other organisms, okay? So this was, it, it's worth the work. Okay, so you guys, we did say these are the basic parts of um, aerobic respiration in a bacterium. So um, glycolysis, the so-called Krebs prep or production of acetyl-CoA, the Krebs cycle, and this, you guys, is where the cell finishes ripping off all the high-energy electrons from glucose. Um, the electrons are going to be delivered to the electron transfer chain. The electrons are the energy source, so the um, ETC can form the proton gradient. And then the proton gradient will drive what we call chemiosmotic production of ATP. And it's by this incredible enzyme complex ATP synthase. Chemiosmosis, you guys, is when the cell use a chemical concentration <coughs> gradient to do work. Is making ATP work? Mm -hmm. It sure is. Yeah. Okay. So you guys, so what we're going to do is we're just... I'm going to erase this for right now. Is that all right? Okay, yeah, you're like, please. And what we're going to do is make a giant bacterium and show, again, you guys, just very superficially what's happening at all of these stages. Okay, so this is going to be our giant bacterial cell. And we'll only get through part of this, you guys. 
So again, this is in a bacterium. This is aerobic respiration. <coughs> giant, 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 giant bacterium. So you might want a, a new page, you guys maybe a longitudinal. Okay, so we're first gonna start, the glucose gets transported in. So we're gonna start out with glycolysis, right? And, and folks, truly, you'd want to be able to cartoon the, the outline of these events for the, um, the lecture exam, because this is a level I'd ask you. So you guys, in glycolysis, we start with glucose. It's going to get split into two what? Pyruvic acid, good. Or pyruvate, either one's fine. What does it take to get it started? We sacrifice what? We spend two ATP, okay, to get it started. We're going to strip off four high-energy electrons. Who are we going to donate them to? Good. To make reduced NADH. And you guys, I'm going to, you know, for me, before I, I finally got this, it's like I had the cartoon. Okay, so these guys are carrying high-energy electrons. I just use little stars for my high-energy electrons. <coughs> Where did those high-energy electrons come from? From glucose, right? Glucose is chock full of high energy electrons, right? That's what we're doing, is slowly ripping them off. Okay, good, good, good. Good, 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 good. Okay, and now are we gonna make any ATP case? For glucose, how many, how many total ATP will we make? Good job, you guys. We're gonna make four. How many did we spend? Minus two, okay, good. So we're gonna have a net gain, a profit of, Two ATP per glucose. And again, you guys, this is substrate level phosphorylation. So let's not forget them. It's easy to forget these guys. Okay, all right. Now you guys, in um, aerobic respiration, the pyruvic acid still has what? Lots and lots of high energy electrons, right? So in aerobic respiration, the cell continues to rip off high energy electrons. So the next part you guys will call the Krebs prep and we'll stop there. And I'll, I'll just do this. I'll take one. I'll just do one at a time, you guys. I'll do one pyruvic acid. What's going to happen is the cell is going to rip off a carbon and release it as CO2. This process is called decarboxylation. So now we're continuing to tear apart the carbon skeleton, right? And then from that, the intermediate, the two-carbon intermediate, we're going to rip off some more electrons and donate them to NAD to make our NADH. And again, we want to recognize you guys high energy electrons, right? And then in the final step, you guys, we're gonna um, have a carrier molecule. I know you're like, what are you talking about? This carrier molecule, you guys, is called coenzyme A. And of course, we abbreviate it as CoA. is gonna be linked up to the little two carbons remaining, and we're gonna end up with acetyl-CoA. Right? And what we have here, you guys, is, is the two carbon remainder of the carbon skeleton still carrying what? What is it still carrying? High energy electrons, right? And I'm just, I'm not counting them, you guys, I'm just putting <coughs> high energy electrons there. And then what we'll do, you guys, on Wednesday, we'll see how the cell will finish ripping off all the high energy electrons in the Krebs cycle. Okay? So believe it or not, you guys, we're, we're almost halfway finished, right? Okay, you guys. Thanks for your patience. I know this is not easy stuff, right? But, but you know, we'll, like I said, we're just doing the main events, right? We don't have to know all the details. Just the main events. Okay, folks. All right. So, I guess I'll see all of you on Wednesday, right? Okay. Okay, you guys. And I will keep my fingers crossed that at least the audio works. I'm not sure the movie works. Maybe the audio works on this thing. That's what we'll keep our fingers crossed for, okay?